Live from the Owen Theater, located in the Glittering Arts and Entertainment District in downtown Conroe, Texas, comes the Crichton Players Vintage Radio Theater. This is your host, Dennis Nelson. Tonight, we present a double Halloween treat from radio's golden age. A show simply entitled, Quiet, Please. Uh, wait a minute, Lori, what happened to the music? It's supposed to be music here. Well, you asked me to be quiet. Uh, you're giving me a heart attack plus apoplexia. Don't you know that silence is the scariest thing on radio? Wait, so um, uh, you, you want the music back? If you wouldn't mind, please. <gasps> Quiet, please. Play again, please. Yes. Three back school, please. Yes. <clears throat> this yeah, Do yes. that one. Now, as I was saying, Quiet, please, comes... Lori... The music has once again ceased. What is the problem? Well, you keep telling me to be quiet. In general, not a bad idea, but <sighs> quiet, please, is the name of the program that we're attempting to do tonight on the show. Wait, um, uh, oh, this is the name of the show? Do you think you might get it now? Oh, um, yeah, I get it. Oh, um, sorry, Dennis, my mistake. Uh, my mistake for showing up. <clears throat> All right. Quiet, please, is the brainchild of a famous... Wait a minute. You start at the right time. You keep playing until you're supposed to stop. Do we need to review? I just thought it'd be funny. <laughs> you thought it would be funny. That kind of humor will put us off the air permanently. Well, comedy always comes in threes. Apparently trouble comes in threes, too. <clears throat> Lori, could we, just for my sake, so that I can stay on the earth a few more years before I pass on, would you please get on with it and stop giving away any trade secrets? Yes, sir. <sighs> Lori Shones, ladies and gentlemen, a consummate musician, and a pain in the neck, yes. Since we've now run out of time and cannot talk about the show we're trying to do, <clears throat> we have only to introduce our stellar cast of players. The stellar Landon Edwards joins us as Porky and Dawn. With us as Ted and Gunnar, please welcome newcomer Preston Ames to our show. Also new to our program, the fantastic Brooke Elizabeth stars as Maxine and Dolores. Finally, pulling double duty as Billy and as our director, we are joined by the excellent Roderick Oust. Now we invite you to sit back, relax if you can, and come with us into a spooky world of horror as we simply ask for quiet, please. Me, I'm a roughneck. Well, I was a roughneck, I mean, 20 years ago. A little too old, a little too slow now. Besides, I got a dollar now, so I don't need to be a roughneck, you see. Married, got a nice home. You have to meet my wife. Mike? Hey, Mike! Her name's Maxine, but she likes to be called Mike. Mike! I guess she's busy out in the kitchen someplace. Besides, she don't hear very well. Shame, too. She's so pretty and everything. Well, you'll meet her. Sit down. As I was saying, I was a roughneck. Well, no, nah, that don't mean exactly what you think it means. Roughneck is an oil field worker, specifically a guy on a drilling crew. Call him roughnecks like you call a section hand on the railroad a gandy dancer or garage hand a grease monkey. 
same time you would work around a drilling crew for a while, you're going to be a roughneck in every sense of the word, boy. A derrick floor or a forval board is no place for a guy with a bow tie because when you have to fool around with drilling holes that go farther down into the ground than it is from the top of Pike's Peak down to sea level, yeah, sure they do. Tom was a roughneck. We got this one well down to 7,313 feet. Now, that was a record. But last May, Pure Oil brought in one out in the Natrona Valley in Wyoming at 14,309 feet. That, friend, is almost three miles. Quite a hole, that, huh? Sure, I don't think there's an old man in the world that don't wonder one time or another what's down there besides rock and oil and gas, oil that's made out of trees that died 20 million years ago, oil that's made out of dinosaur bones, or oil that's maybe made out of the flesh of men. Maybe that beat each other to death with a stone axe and ate saber-toothed tiger for lunch. Yeah, you get to wondering. You look at the cores that come up from way down there and sometimes there's little shells, trilobites mostly. That was alive when Manhattan Island, where New York is, was under half a mile of ice. We found something once, me and Billy Grimwald, and something found us. I'll tell you about it. Clear down to around 5,400 feet, we'd set casing that began to get water, so we had to stop drilling and cement off. Well, you see, when water begins to seep in the hole, you pull your drill pipe, then you let down a cement and shoe inside the casing, and you plug up the bottom of the hole, casing and all, with quick hardening, waterproof cement. Then when it's hard, you drill through the cement and go down, and the cement outside the casing at the bottom keeps the water out. Well. We had the drill pipe all pulled and racked. The cement was setting, see? So we were shut down, waiting for it to harden. We'd been coring just before. Well, you see, a core drill is hollow. And as the bit digs down, it stuffs the drilling drillings up inside it, so when you pull it out, you got a sample of the kind of stuff you're going through. And a geologist can tell a lot from that, so there's nobody around the rig except me that night. The rest of the crew's gone into town. I was toasting up some pork chops over the porch for myself when I heard a car pulling up. Look out, it's Billy Grimwald, the geologist, and I give him a hello. Hey, Billy, come out of a pork chop. All right, Porky. And where is everybody? They all went to town. I'm the whole crew. Well, I had three blowouts between here and Oxnard. Yeah, I wonder where you was. Ted said you'd be in here about three. Yeah, I would have been, except for my tough luck. Oh, I'm dead. Hungry? Starved. Here, I got six, nope, seven pork chops and bread. And some coffee, kind of. Swell. Hey, <laughs> uh, I got a bottle in the car. <laughs> We're gonna have a banquet. Hey, uh, where's that core? That's what I came up here to look at. Uh, back there on the bench. Look at it after supper. Hey. What? Didn't you say you were here all alone? Yeah. Well, I thought I heard somebody talking. I don't see anybody. Keep an eye on that pork chop. You won't have any supper. Well, I'm watching it. Here, let me put the coffee on. Like so. And when you finish cementing? This morning. Last tower only made about 10 feet of hole, so Ted shut down before we get flooded out of the house and home. It's funny about that water. How? Well, there oughtn't be any at that level, according to my figuring. Well, there is. Is it salt? Sure, right out of the bottom of the ocean. Hmm. Well, that's funny. Well, maybe I'll be able to tell something from the core. Yeah, I hope so. Well, last core I looked at, I'd have sworn we were getting into shale. I ain't seen none yet from the cuttings. <laughs> it's funny. Hey, your pork chop's done. Take some bread. Yeah, thanks. Oh, man. Good, huh? Mm-hmm. Put on another. I had two already before you come. Yeah, much obliged. Yeah, you know, you never can tell what's down there. You get it all mapped and plotted out, all that strata, and all you know is what comes out of the hole. Yep, I'd like to go down there sometime if I was little enough. <laughs> never get you down a hole. You'd fit, you're skinny. Well, I'll stay up here and look at the cores, bud. Now, where is that one? Behind you, over there. Hmm? Oh, 
Well, I'll have a look at it. Why don't you wait till you finish your supper? Oh, I'm just gonna look at it. Uh, put another pork chop on for me. All right. Wow, I wish these street chowls would keep. Ah! Whoa! What's the matter? Hey, hey, wait a minute, Porky. Well, what? Listen. What's eating you? You know, I'd have sworn there's somebody up on that formal board. Oh, you're crazy. There's nobody up there. Standing off against those stands of drill pipe. Ah, uh, they're just rat crooked. One of them slipped. Come on back and eat your pork chop. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. Only I... Ah, uh, what you so jittery about, Billy? Come on, eat your sandwich. Here. Yeah, well, well, thanks, Porky. I don't know. I, I'm just naturally that way, I guess. I'm always scared of the dark. Doggone it, I hate to be a baby about it, but I just can't help it. Scared of the dark? Honest? Stupid, ain't it? Well, I don't know. Everybody's scared of something. Me? Spiders scare the tar out of me. Black widows. <laughs> I know how you feel, Billy. Hey, um, is there, there another light over there? Yeah, here. Ah, <laughs> that's better. Hey, uh, uh listen, uh, Porky. Uh, go out to the car and look in the left-hand door pocket and bring me back that bottle, will ya? Now that's what I need. All right. So I picked up a flashlight, turned around, went outside. I found the car. I got the bottle. And the floor of the derrick was all lit up, and when I saw a beam of light suddenly flash up toward the formal board, I laughed. <laughs> Billy Grimwald and his ideas. Sure, I looked up. Wasn't a darn thing up there. Except the drill pipe wrapped against the fingerboard. Uh, this uh, forbal board, well, you seen old derricks or pictures of them? You know that little platform that runs around the outside of the derrick about halfway up? That's a forbal board. Well, you see, drill pipe comes in lengths, and you handle them with several lengths screwed together so as to save time getting them in and out of the hole. Two lengths is a double, three is a treble, four is a forbal. When you pull the pipe, you heist it up inside the derrick with a traveling block, which moves up and down from the crown block at the top of the derrick. Then when a forbal of pipe is pulled out, it's held in the rotary table. You break the joint with tongs like a great big Stilson wrench, you see. Snub a cable that's fastened to the handle over the cat head on the draw works, and that breaks the joint. Then you hold the two tongs on the pipe, give the rotary table a few turns to unscrew it, Heist away with the traveling block and swing it over against the fingerboard, lean it against the derrick. Then the guy up on the forward board takes off the traveling block, and you do it all over again till you got all the pipe out, you see. Well, there wasn't anybody up there on the forward board except a screech owl, and it flew away. So Billy turned his light off, and I come on inside. And just as I come up the steps, he let out a yell. What's the matter? What's the matter, Billy? Hey, come here. Look here. Well, what's... Look, Porky. Huh? Where'd you find that? Now, now listen, Porky. I give you my word. That was embedded in the core. Oh, it couldn't be. I tell you, it was. Now, look where I dug it out. You know what? That rock there comes from a mile underground. And it's been a mile underground for a million years. Man, look at this. And I did look. And what he was holding was a gold ring. And it was all carved and filigree, just like jewelry. And there wasn't any kidding about it. It was real. No, 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 wait a minute, hold on, hang on, I ain't done. I poked at the coral rock that looked like a kind of a petrified salami or something. And then it was my turn to pretty near jump out of my pants. It was right alongside the place where Billy dug out the ring. There was a mud-covered but very unmistakable finger. And I picked it up. It was cold. It was heavy. It was solid rock. At least it felt like solid rock. And I looked at Billy, and Billy looked at me. He started to rub the mud off this here stone finger. And 
as he rubbed it, it began to disappear. No, he could, he could still feel it, he said, but when the mud was gone, neither one of us could see it. And he dropped it to the derrick floor. It went clunk. <coughs> we couldn't find it any place. So you know what we done? Well, we took that bottle and we took and finished it, Billy and me. We finished it in one slug a piece and it was a full pint of bathtub gin that tasted just like so much well water to me. Then we sat down on the derrick floor and we looked at each other. Didn't say a word. My eyes got heavier and heavier. Last thing I remember was I heard some kind of noise that seemed to be coming out from, well, the forward board, 80 feet above us. I shut my eyes a minute. I guess I went to sleep. I had awful dreams. Black widow spiders crawling all over me with gold rings on their legs. Things I could hear but couldn't see up on the forward board. Billy Grimwald climbing up the ladder outside the derrick in the moonlight. Faces looking at me. I couldn't figure out who they were. Then I was waked up by a horrible scream and a crash alongside me that shook the whole derrick. I opened my eyes to see Billy Grimwald lying on the floor two feet away with a broken neck. With a broken neck in his left hand. Well, he put the gold ring on the little finger of his left hand and the way his arms were spread out, his little left finger and the ring were gone. And I got out of there. I run down to where Billy had left his car and I got in. I stepped on the starter. I couldn't get it to go. I remembered after I pretty near run down the battery that Billy had taken the key. And I wasn't going up there and going through a dead man's clothes to get it, so I sat there in the car and shivered all by myself till daylight. <laughs> And then Ted and the crew came. Afterwards, a state cop and everybody in the world was asking me questions. Did you and Billy have a fight, Porky? I told you we didn't, Ted. But you had been drinking. We only had that one little pint. Well, what was he doing up on the forward board? Did you threaten him? And did he run up there to get away from you? Listen, cop, don't be a chump. Billy Grimwald and I were good friends. Then why'd you push him off the forward board? I did not tell you. I wasn't up there. Well, why did he go up there? I don't know. I was asleep. How do you know he was up there? I didn't say he was. You said so. Besides, how would he break his neck if he didn't fall from way up there? Well, look, officer, I think it was just another accident. I mean, we haven't got anything on Porky. Personally, I don't believe he did it. Well, it's mighty suspicious. So it is. But we've got work to do. Now, how about it? That cement's hard down there, and I want to start drilling again. I'm short-handed. Will you let Porky stay here till I run my pipe again? And, well, then you can take him and ask him all the questions till you're blue in the face. Well, okay. Now let's get rolling. You got steel up, Happy? I'm all set. All right. Porky, you go up on the forward board. What? Not me, Ted. Ah, oh, don't be such a boob. There's nobody up there to shove you overboard. Hey, you can put on a safety line around if you want to. And besides, you're getting paid to do what you're told. I've lost too much time already. Now come on, get going. So okay, I go up on the forward board. You can bet I took a good gander around before I did anything else. No, I couldn't see a thing. So I sent him to the driller to let down the traveling block, and he did. Came sailing down from up above. I was just reaching for it to pick up the first four bullet drill pipe, gave a big jerk and the cable broke, and dropped and nearly pulled me off the forward board. And it 
landed. Landed right on top of Ted. If you have any idea what a guy looks like after two ton of metal land on him from 80 feet up, well, you keep your ideas to yourself. Well, that was enough. Two accidents in a row. Whole crew quit. They weren't gonna wait for a third. And it was Ted's money that was paying off. There wasn't any more. And as far as I know, the abandoned Derek is still there. And that was 20 years ago. Now, I forgot to tell you something. That traveling block was right in front of my face when it broke loose. It was hanging by steel cable, three quarter inch steel cable. And I saw that cable break right before my eyes. It was just like a piece of string and you snap it between your fingers. I could almost see the fingers. And you know what? There was something up there on the football board with me. So a couple of days later, I came back. I don't know if there's anything else in the world as desolate, dismal, dead looking as an abandoned oil well rig. But there it stood, like a skeleton off on a deserted side road in the bare yellow hills surrounding it. And it's the deadest thing you ever saw. I sat in my car for a long time looking at it. Everything was just the way, just the way we left it. I looked in at the floor. Smashed traveling block was there alongside the rotary table. There was a little mutter of steam from the boiler, but that was it. Then I heard a tingle of something as it hit the ground alongside me. I looked around, there wasn't a soul in sight. But at my feet was the gold ring that Billy Grimwald and I had found in the core rock that came up from a mile on the ground and from a million years ago in time. I heard a little sound. The sound of a kid crying. There wasn't any kid up there. I heard it again, and it came from above my head, and I took out my revolver, loaded it carefully, and I started up the ladder to the forbal board, but there wasn't anything up there, nothing I could see. It was a voice crying, the voice of a little kid, and there was a movement behind the rack of drill pipe, and I saw the pipe move, and I yelled, come out of there, whoever you are. Come out or I'll start shooting. Then the stand of pipes shivered and I thought, what can it be that can handle a heavy pipe like jack straws? Then there was a crash. The whole stand of pipe fell over and I just got out of the way in time. I was alone. I was alone on the forward board that thing, but I couldn't see it. I felt the platform tremble under my feet again as something moved toward me. I fired two or three shots. Nothing happened. I started backwards. I knew it was following me because I could hear it meowing like a cat. My feet tripped over something. I saw it was a big can of red lead that somebody had left up there. And without thinking, I picked it up and threw it at the sound and it splashed. And there it was. I wish I, I wish, the face of a little girl, frightened, 
crying with hungry terror. Hands like a human being. A finger missing from the left hand. And a body. Well, I'll tell you about that. Told you how I'm scared of spiders. But I knew where it come from. It had come from the bowels of the earth. Come riding up on the drill pipe as we yanked it out of the well. Come to an alien world. It was lost. It stood there dripping with red paint, blood red from head to foot, like some horrible dream. And it put its hand on my heart. Its hand was stone, living, moving, stone. And it looked into my eyes and mewed like a lost kitten. Twenty years ago, I discovered many things about it. What it used for food, that it was deaf, that it was invisible and couldn't see people when it was invisible, that if you sprayed it with mud or paint or grease paint, makeup, then it could see people. And believe me, I didn't want to see its body. I could see that in my nightmares. But its face, and I can't, I can't help wanting to see that pathetic little girl face. I'm afraid maybe I've fallen. Ah, but it's very beautiful. And when it's well made up, it's but making it up, rubbing grease paint on a stone face that looks at you and smiles and makes sounds like a lost kitten yet. I can disguise the body in long dresses. She can't hear very well and when she's hungry, I need to stay out of her way. I found out what she likes to eat, remember? No, no, sit still. Sit still, dude. Sit still or I'll have to shoot you. I want you to meet my wife. Or rather, my wife wants to meet you. Mike? Mike? There she is. Come on in, dear. Don't go away. In a few moments, we'll be back with the second episode of tonight's double feature. But first, here are some important words directed just at you. Hey, look at this brochure. Is, is that the Crichton Players season lineup? Indeed it is. Ah, oh, rats, we just missed Bye Bye Birdie. What, what, tell me, what's coming up for the rest of 2015? Let's see. Oh, Moon Over Buffalo is open now until November 1st. And Meet Me in St. Louis goes up in time for the holidays. Let me see that. Wow, 2016 also brings us the hilarious murder at the Howard Johnson's. As well as William Shakespeare's timeless tale, Romeo and Juliet. And then there's the unparalleled smash musical Chicago. And finishing off with the riveting Agatha Christie classic, The Mousetrap. For more information on discount tickets for the season, go to owentheater.com. That's O-W-E-N-T-H-E-A-T-R-E.com. And be sure to join us, because the hits just keep coming at the Owen Theater. And now for the second episode of tonight's double feature, we return to Quiet, Please.
listen to the sound of the sea. The sound of the sea, the surf, the ceaseless measured sound of the sea. I have heard the voices of the oceans of the world on the shingle at Brighton against the frowning heights of Point Sur, on the long hot beaches of Hawaii and the cold foggy reaches of Atu. And again, I've heard the seas that lash the shores of Okinawa and Kwajalein, their thunder, a tiny sound under the sound of battle, but the sound of the sea at Hunim is, is the sound of them all that I could never forget. Though sure, I will never hear it again as I did those lost days so long ago. For where the salt grass grew in the hollows of the dunes, there is concrete and steel and great buildings. Where the house was, there is a confusion of men and machines and echoing high walls, and the wet sand that gleamed darkly for so many lonely, lovely miles, far below the wide concrete roads and the massive buildings. And the ghosts that lived at Hunim seek their homes in vain. Still, the rocky islands, Grim Anacapa, and hapless Santa Cruz, and the little nameless ones, they gaze lonesome to the mainland. And the bones of Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo rest in hard won peace somewhere between wind and water, and the seagulls scream and the wheel above the place that was once a desolation. But it is not a city. And there are those who mourn for the lost, windy loneliness of Hunim, for it has gone and vanished utterly. And great ships nudge the piers where the greaves in the city turns and the pelicans forge so long, so long ago. Now Don and I wandered among the dunes many a sunny day and many a sunset saw us seeking shelter wearily enough that summer, Don with his easel and paint box, and I with my camera and all, for that was the summer Hunim was the subject of our pictures, and there were many. And this is the tale, I suppose, of what we pictured, Don and I. In our blankets beside our battered car on the edge of the broken road in the cold night, we lay and watched the high stars wheel above us, mighty Orion and the bears, and the endless mysterious arc of the Milky Way, and the sound of the surf was always behind our low voices as we spoke of many things. It was like this a thousand years ago. The sea and the sand and the stars and nothing else. They called this the safe place the old Indians did. It's very peaceful. Have you ever been here in the storm time when the waves run in like horses with great white manes and leap high in the air to crash down furious on the sand so that it shakes the very world? I have seen them. My people have always thought of the storm waves as horses of the sea. Your people are fey like mine. If you mean their dreams live, then that is right. There is a place that my people speak about, the old ones, a place where there is never death, and those who come upon the place live forever. I think it must be a place like this Hunim. It would be a very lonely place, for not many would come upon it. It's so. They say it's beside the everlasting sea somewhere, not the bleak sea of my people's country, with the barren rocks and the dreary kelp to tangle your feet and draw you down to the cold bottom of it. This could be that place. It could be that. It's lonesome enough. Yet there's a feeling of others here besides us. Others not of this world, but from the distant past, waiting and watching us from outside the little circle of our firelight. Come to our fireside, you other ones in the cold dark. Come sit with us by the warmth of the fire. That was not well advised, Gunnar. Do you believe the tales you have heard, then? I could not tell you the many things I believe, the many, many things. Are you afraid of the other ones, then? I'm afraid of nothing mortal. Of spirits that you gainsay my welcome to the ones beyond the firelight? If they are evil. Can they be evil? If this place be the never-never land your people speak of. A man may lose his immortal soul in trafficking with unknown things, Gunnar. But also, a man may find everlasting happiness, for there must be love in the hearts of these others, as well as lurking evil. It is known that a few good people have found their way to the timeless, deathless land. The safe place, this Hunim. The safe place. Could it be so, Don? It could be. Now, in the night. Listen. What is it? In the sound of the sea, there was something more. A voice? 
Did it listen? A voice that you heard? The voice of one of the others that you called to us? Look to the sea. There's nothing. A white thing in the darkness. Will you go see it? Come with me. And we rose from our blankets and stood a moment, shivering in the keen little wind of the night. And Don caught up a brand from the fire for a torch, and together we walked down to the place where the sand met the water. And there was nothing. No white figure in the boiling surf, no person in that place save us two. But as we turned to go back to our little fire, Don raised his torch high, and he called to me. Gunnar, come here! I came to his side, and he stretched out his hand and to the smoothness of the beach beside him. And on the wet sand were footprints, bare footprints in the sand, and the footprints came up out of the sea. In the flickering red glow from the torch, we traced these footprints so that now there were three sets, Don's and mine and these of the outsider. And the trace went straight up to the edge of the glow from our fire. There we saw a deeper prince where she had stood, for we know it was a woman. The prints were tiny and delicate in the rough sand where she had stood and perhaps listened to our talk. And then the footprints moved away again, and when we followed them, we found that they had returned to the sea. And that was all that night. For though we sat sleepless and silent till the sun rising behind the dunes warmed our backs in the morning, there was no sound nor no sight of another at Hunim that night. But then it was day, and it was dawn who must go away to the city, for we, the two of us, were poor, and there was work to be done to pay for the long days on the sands of Hunim. I walked alone with my camera, south along the beach, pausing to make a picture of a white tree bench tossed ashore by the restless waves. Pausing to scan the horizon seaward and landward, there was never a soul to see. So I found the house, the little hut, the little black house on the strand. I had not seen it before. It was hidden in a little fold of the dunes, and I came upon it unawares. She was standing in the doorway, looking out to the sea, and my heart gave a great leap at the sight of her, and I raised my camera, and I had the picture before she had turned and saw me. Oh, who are... Who are you? I was hoping that you should find this place. I have heard your voice. And I have seen your face in the firelight with another. Who are you? I am Dolores. I am called Gnar. Gnar? That's a strange name. My people are from the Northland. My people were Viking fairs. They were people of the sea like mine? They sailed the well road in their high proud ships, and they conquered many people. My people found a new world. Well then, welcome, son of seafarers, for I have waited long for you. But I, I do not know you. How could you wait for me that you do not know? Who are you? I am Dolores. And I ask you straight without evasion, tell me, could you love me, Gnar? I think that when I first heard your voice in the night... You are slow of speech, Gnar. Are all of your people slow of speech, slow to love? It is only that I cannot find words to make my answer to you. Tell me truly, tell me straightly, could you love me, Gnar? I could love you more than is due any mortal woman, Dolores, even though my eyes see you this moment for the first time. Then I have not waited all these years in vain, Gnar. No, do not touch me. The time will come. Now I must go from you for a little while. But say again that you love me, Gnar, for I love you. <laughs> And her words to me were the sweetest sounds that I had ever heard under the sun or moon. And I took a step toward her to take her in my arms. For suddenly, I knew that my first love of all my life had come to me, and that it should be with me, always. Then, a little cloud came from nowhere in the sky above us, and its shadow fell upon us too as Dolores turned away from me and walked slowly down to the sea. And try as I might, I could not follow. And I closed my eyes for a little moment, 
and when I opened them again, I was alone beside the haunted house, the little black hut on the shore. And in the evening, dawn came, and I led him to the little house, and we made a little driftwood fire, and we ate the provisions that he had brought, and the quick night came down upon us, and I said to Don, I saw her today. I wondered. I saw her at this house. It was no daydream? No. I saw her, and I heard her voice. In the light of day? In the light of day. I saw Dolores, and spoke to her, and she to me. Dolores. She loves me, Don. She said she loves me. And you? What did you say to her? Why, I said I love her. I warned you last night under the stars, Gunnar. Warned me? There is many a tale of those who invite the outsiders to come and sit with them, as I have told you. There is lore that one who plights his love to one of the outsiders is in danger of destruction. I love her. Does man fall in love so sudden? There never was such a thing, Don. I love her. You touched her? No, she went away. Away then. Back into the sea. There was a little cloud over our heads and... Well then? Well, what the what? You dreamed it in the sunshine. No. Sure, you dreamed it in the sunshine, and in your dream you remembered the footprints that led down to the sea, and it was all a dream, Gunnar. Sleep, Gunnar, and you'll dream of her again. It was no dream. I told you the tale of the timeless land, and you dreamed. Was it a dream last night? No. Why, I have proof that I saw her, Don. I remember. Don, I made a picture of her standing in this very doorway. Show me the picture and I'll believe it was no dream then. And I took my little tanks and my camera and I mixed my powders with some part of our drinking water and inside the little hut, I sat in the dark and developed the film from the camera whilst Don smoked in peace outside in the cool. And when the task was done, I took the film outside to him and I said, here, here's the proof. So Don took up his flashlight and he scanned the film very closely. Here, I said, here's the picture of the house. Do you see? And he looked at the wet, snaky film very, very narrowly. And then he handed it back carefully. Here, look for yourself. And I held up the flashlight and I looked long and narrowly. And there was the little house as clear as ever was. And, this, and it was the only picture I'd made of it in all the long world of film. And it was clear and sharp and recognizable. But of Dolores, who had stood in the doorway, there was no sign. And I spoke no more of the matter to Don, my friend, but my dreams were strange, beyond belief. I saw a great ship, a galleon, and at its truck an ensign of red and gold, and I heard the deep sound of drums and chantings of multitude of voices. And ever the waves dashed high before me, and somewhere there was a woman's cry echoing from across the water. But I spoke no more of the matter to Don. Then Don went away again, and I was alone in the night, alone and sleepless for many a long hour, till I heard the wind rise, and a voice spoke to me in the heavy, cold darkness. It was Dolores. I am come again to you, Gnar, my beloved. You are Dolores in the night, come from the sea. I am Dolores, come to my beloved from the sea in the night. It was no dream? No, it was no dream, beloved. Touch my hand, Dolores. I may not, nor may you touch me. It is because you are a spirit, not a living woman? That is so. I have no fear of you. Why should you fear me, since I love you, Gnar? Don told me to beware of you. I love you. And I have told you I love you, yet how shall we? What is to become of our love? between a spirit and a mortal. Will you say that to me, Dolores? I will say to you that mortals have souls that are immortal. Must I die then to win you forever? I am Dolores Maria de las Nieves Acosta e Cabrillo. My mother brought me from Estremadura in Spain to the land of Mexico so many years ago that we might be with my father who was Don Juan Rodriguez Caprillo, whom men called the Little Goat, and he was a famous captain of the seas. Your father is dead then? 
See, he lies in a forgotten grave beside the harbor of the island called La Possession out there. I know of no La Possession. There is Ancapa, Santa Cruz, San Miguel. No matter. Doubtless they have changed its name. I will tell you, Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo is dead these many years, and I, his daughter, have watched over his grave. He died that January morning in the cold rain, and we put into La Possession. And there they buried him, and they sailed away again back to Alisco. Ah, Aliso, que es bonita, and I shall never see Alisco again, for I must stay in the land of Hunim, the safe place, the timeless place forever. You lived on the island then, Dolores. See, si, for I would not leave my father's grave. My mother, she died before we set out for the land of California. And there is none who remembers me in Alisco. Thus I am bound to this place. It has been a long time, Dolores, and you have found none to love you? It was the third day of the new year. The new year? The year 1542. And night unto 400 years have I lived on that bleak island. Lived? I have been there. Let us not say I lived. Yet until two nights ago, I have never come upon any man living or dead whom I can love. Only you, Gunnar. Yet yeah, te amo. Gunnar, I love you forever. I love you, Dolores. Beyond the saying of it. But what shall I do? Tell me. Go not from here ever, Gunnar. Stay in this Hunim and I shall come to your side whenever you call me. Must I be enchanted to this place always? No, I am reasonable. I know men must labor for their bread. They must go fight in the wars. They must do others' bidding. Go where others send them. I remember I was a woman I lived. I know. Go as you must go, Gunnar. Go, but always come back to Hunim. For here am I, Gunnar. And here I must stay. Thus you must come back always. I will come back. Never forget, Gunnar. How shall I forget, Dolores? It is a very sharp-horned dilemma. It is a very strange thing. How shall I know if this is not a dream indeed? For if it is, then I love a dream. And if it be reality, then must I die to win my love? For she is a spirit, and I am flesh, and how shall the two wed? How shall I know that this is not a dream, a disorder of the mind, a sickness? For I love this woman, this wraith, this daughter of an ancient sea captain, whether she dwells alone on a rock island or exists only in my brain. Proof of my love? Proof that I exist? Proof that I am here, that I remain here, awaiting only you. Here, Gunnar, my lover, here is proof. Look upon these pearls in the light of day and know that thy Dolores loves thee. And so I raised my eyes and she was gone. But before me, on the rude table in the haunted hut by the sea, lay this string of fair, lovely pearls, and on the clasp was engraved the name, Dolores. So it seems to me that I did not dream. You did not dream, Gunnar, and I love you. I love Dolores, dead these 400 years. They are very real pearls, Gunnar, and priceless. Priceless? Tell me, Don. Speak to me out of your wisdom, for you are Fay also. Tell me what to do. You are very much in love. I am much in love. So you think of doing away with yourself? It is in my mind. So that being then a spirit yourself, you and Dolores... Yes. No. You say no? I have heard it said that that is the surest way to utter destruction. So have I, but Dolores... It is a dark and bitter thing, Gunnar, yet you must wait. How shall I wait? I cannot counsel you, save only in this matter. Do not destroy yourself, for if you do... 
I, but if I live, I become old and wasted. No. She will forget me. She has waited night unto 400 years, Gunnar. But if I must go away from here... I will help you come back, Gunnar. I, I grow feeble and sick and cannot remember. I will remember, Gunnar, for I am your friend. I will remember. You believe then, Don? Yes, Gunnar, I believe. And I shall remember. You have sworn it, Don. Send Gunnar back to me. And Gunnar went away as he had known from the beginning that he must go. For his work was far away, a continent away, from the lonely sands of Hunim. And he told me he would come back as soon as he would arrange his affairs, and he would stay then forever until he died on that lonely, haunted place. And time wore on, and his letters he spoke always of the sand and the sea and the stars, and Dolores, and I walked often alone, too, on the sands of Hunim. And in the little Oxnard cemetery, hard by where the tall eucalyptus trees weep over the gray headstones in the winter rain, and of a lonely night on the shore, I felt a presence near me, and I cried out to the wind and the surf, He will come back, Dolores! I will keep my promise! And always over the sound of the wind among the dunes, a voice answered me. Remember, remember, remember. And a year went by, and a year, and a year. And the lightnings of war struck, and I knew that I must go. For were not my forefathers fighting men of the sea? And I had none to hold me back. I was an orphan, with neither brother nor sister, only my friend Don. So I became a seafarer again, but this time a very strange one, for they put me, for my knowledge, into the sea bees, and I was content. And I had not seen Don all these long years, and many things had crowded into my mind and my life, and it had been many months since I had heard from him. But always the thought of Dolores had been in my mind, and I dreamed of her so many times, and the thought of a happy day when I should return to her forever. And I thought of you, and I wept to think of that war. And I dreamed of Gnar lying dead in some far, forgotten place, once he could never return to me. And in my letters to Gnar, I never told him what had become of the sandy beach of Hunim, how tall buildings and great docks were built there, and how the face of the land was changed so that no man could recognize it. How could he come back to Hunim now? It's gone. The trysting place, the old haunted house, is gone, and the sea thunders against high walls, and... This is Don. Don! Don, I go to the South Pacific! Gunnar! And Don, hear me, Don. I'm calling, I'm coming to Hunim. I'm sailing from Hunim. I'll see Dolores! <laughs> High resounding walls, long piers, and jetties out into the sea. Noise and confusion and lights that dim the stars at night. Men and machines and ships. Steel and concrete. Hunim? And I walked down the echoing streets and called, Dolores! Dolores! And there was only the echo of the little song she used to sing. And we sailed away into the night, and I wept as the lights of Hunim dimmed into the blackness of the night in wartime, for I knew I had lost my Dolores now, forever. And I stand in the rain-drenched little Oxnard Cemetery hard by the great bustling port of Hunim, and there's a sound of weeping. A woman weeping in my ears. He is dead. He is dead on a far, far island, and I shall never see him again. Oh, Don, Don, I loved him so. I have not forgotten my promise, Dolores. Here, in this place. This is Hunim, too, isn't it? 
Why, this is Hunin. All the great houses and the ships and the... Why, this is Hunin. Look up, Dolores. Look up at the gate. Soldiers and sailors and a coffin with a flag on it? I have kept my promise, Dolores. Gnar, Gnar, you've come back to me. Thank you once again for joining us during this bone-chilling double feature of the Crichton Players Vintage Radio Theater right here at the Owen. Special thanks go to director O.A. Melvin and the cast and crew of Moon Over Buffalo for letting us borrow their stage tonight. This madcap comedy is now open and runs weekends through November 1st. More details on tickets for our Crichton Players season can be found at owentheater.com. Tonight's technical credits go to Dick Schistler as sound engineer, who also acted as producer for Lone Star Internet Radio. Sound effects were performed live and from scratch without the use of recordings by the whole cast. <laughs> Commercial announcers were Roderick Aust and Dennis Nelson. Our live music was improvised by the one and only Lori Shones. <laughs> and of course, tonight's episode was directed by Roderick Aust. Our cast featured Landon Edwards as Porky and Dawn, Preston Ames as Dead and Gunnar, Brooke Elizabeth as Maxine and Dolores, and Roderick Oust as Billy and the police officer. Series producer on behalf of the Crichton players was Timothy Eggert. The Crichton Players Vintage Radio Theater was originally created as the Players Theater Company Old Time Radio Hour by Craig Campobella and Dick Schistler. This episode of the Crichton Players Vintage Radio Theater was performed live in the Owen Theater in partnership with Lone Star Internet Radio in Conroe, Texas on October 25th, 2015 and was recorded for Encore Broadcasts. Visit IRLoneStar.com every month for freshly archived programs like The Shadow, which is now available on demand for your listening pleasure. If you are an actor in the Conroe or greater Houston area, you are invited to audition for our next episode. The audition will be in the Owen Theater on Wednesday, November 4th. The upcoming production is a double feature of The Great Gildersleeve, just in time for Thanksgiving. Our program airs live from the Owen on Sunday, November 15th at 7 p.m. In the meantime, be sure to listen for us every Sunday night at 7 p.m. on Lone Star Internet Radio. Again, our thanks, our very great thanks for joining us during our season premiere from the glittering Arts District of downtown Conroe, this is your series host, Dennis Nelson, wishing you a very pleasant good evening.